It's been said, the whole world is a stage and everybody plays a part. But the question remains, who's writing the script? Welcome to Around the Fire. I wish you was here helping me go through this manhood thing. Without you, it's very hard, very hard. Moving in with you was one of my best decisions I've ever made in my entire life. That's when I learned the meaning of a sacrifice. I hope you know how much being your son has been the greatest blessing, my highest honor, grandest achievement, and the most profound unconditional love. I thank you for being my dad. Your brother had me selling drugs at each five. I was molested, thrown down the steps by an older cousin because I wouldn't stop crying. So he tried to kill me to shut me up. Hi, I'm Frank Robinson, producer of Around the Fire. And today I'd like to take you on a journey to a place where men feel free to express their joys, pains, sorrows, angers, and gratitudes as it relates to their relationship with their fathers. The place is found in this book, A Letter to My Father, where a group of very courageous men have come together, led by the vision of author Gary Feimster, to share their stories in the form of letters written to their fathers. So join us as guest host Dr. Wesley Willis, author Gary Feimster, and a few of the writers share their letters, thoughts, and feelings about this most fundamental relationship in a letter to my father. Enjoy. Dear Pops, I love you. I miss you. That's why my superhero is you. It's strange to me how much I've always wanted your love. Even though you were physically present, you were emotionally absent. And as a result of your dad not being a part of your life, and not teaching you to be a man, you chose to punish me by not being present. Thank God for a mother who had the wisdom to raise me to be a good man. I don't need a father, I told her. I never could grasp how you could leave me for another man to raise. Because I knew from the day my first child was conceived that I never wanted anyone to feel for me the way I feel for you. Every boy needs a dad. Every man. Needs a father. My name is Dr. Wesley Willis, and today we're here on Around the Fire. We're sitting here with author Gary Themester and contributors who will be reading their letters today. We're looking forward to having a conversation and a dialogue that will open up, hopefully, much more conversation in the future. Dear Dad, where are you? Where have you been? I know you're no longer here. It's been nine years since you passed. I still miss you. I've missed you for most of my life. First steps, graduations, wedding, you were not there. I'm now the age you were when we first met 30 years ago. And I remember that day as if it were yesterday. I was 23 and meeting my father for the very first time. Awkward. I traveled on Greyhound from Philly to Hartford, Connecticut, the entire time wondering why I was on that bus. Truthfully, the only reason was that mom thought that meeting you would help me to understand myself better. I thought she was crazy. The strangest thing was walking through that Hartford bus terminal 
I knew you instantly. As you walked towards me, I saw myself in your eyes, your walk, your face. A stranger. My father looked just like me. I had no idea what to do or what to say. We embraced, and so began our journey. I got to know who Al was, and you got to know Guy. More like man to man than father to son. I learned who you were, but even more who I was. So much like you physically, mentally, and emotionally, I learned to understand why I like big dreams and big ideas. We never spoke about it, but you helped me to understand who I am as a man. I learned to forgive and accept what is through our time together. Big lessons. I also learned how to enjoy, enjoy the moment. I discovered how silly we both are. I saw my reflection in you, and I knew you saw yours in me. I wonder how our lives would have been different if you had been in my life always. I would never know. I can only be happy for the moments and for your wisdom. You were wiser than I ever expected, and you knew me better than I knew myself. As I write this, tears are falling on the page. It is strange to me how much I always wanted your love, how much I missed it growing up. The pain does not go away. I always wanted you to be proud of the man I am. I sense that you wanted me to be proud of you as well. I thank God for a mother who had the wisdom to raise me to be a good man, a mother who had the insight to facilitate me meeting you. If not for her, it would never have happened. I could not see through the anger. I do not need a father, I told her. I never could grasp how you could leave me for another man to raise. There was so much I had to figure out. No one to guide me. I stumbled. I learned to be self-reliant. I learned how to walk, talk, and appear fearless. Many times it was just a facade. Without guidance, I created myself. It has been a struggle, but I'm proud of who I've become. I realize that every boy needs a dad. Every man needs a father. Rest in peace, Al. You did the best you could, but I still long for more. I want to start this segment by thanking Gary Feimster for putting this book together and adding to the, the lack of information and resources that we have about how black men and how you express it in your book, men in general experience their relationships with their father from being young boys to adulthood and how that translates into that relationship and how that even more translates into relationships with others. And I want to start by asking Gary, I know you're involved with a lot of different projects. What brought this even into your kind of mind to do? Well, one of my favorite quotes or sayings is divine synchronicity. And um, I'd like to say, oh, I came up with this great idea, but I honestly feel that this project is coming through me, not from me. It's these courageous men that you see on the stage and men from all over the country that have really contributed to making this dream a reality. But the initial catalyst, I think, just came through many conversations with men, mostly at the barbershop, um, talking about sons and the state of black men and black affairs and that natural progression went to fatherhood and then you know I was commonly uh, speaking about my father and the lessons he instilled in me even though he passed when I was just 12 uh, right before my 13th birthday from lung cancer but his voice is still very present I'm constantly replaying those words so I feel that this project the book the movement has all been divine synchronicity and all these men kind of showed up without having to really ask anyone to do a letter just like just telling them about the book I did that's basically all of the letter writers just came effortlessly so that was pretty much the catalyst my name is Malik Shakur hey dad I can't begin to tell you how much you piss me off sometimes. 
you swoop into my life as if you're, it's yours to own and get angry when I push back against your interference. What I don't get is how you continually fail to realize that you don't have a say in what decisions I make or will make. I think you need a small reality check, so here we go. In case you forgot, I'm an adult with whom is painfully independent. And any decisions I make or will make are what's best for me, not what's best for you. Like you've always said, heavy is the head that wears the crown. But how will I know how heavy the crown is unless you let me wear it? Pop, I need you to understand I've had no greater joy than having you as my dad. When I talk about you with my friends, my potential partners, employers, or just casual conversation, I glean with such pride of being the son of a man who was raised by raised me to be a powerful and faithful Muslim. It was your manhood that was instilled in, instilled in you by your dad and is your life experiences instilled in me by teaching me the political principles of the nation, the OAAU, the importance of being a black nationalist, and most importantly, white is not always right. Your foundation of Garveyism taught, taught to you by your father and that self-respect we Jamaicans have and that importance of education taught to you by his father the last slave in our family and the first to be college educated is what my rock of Gibraltar is built upon. But I also realize the responsibility and the power, this blood that runs through the generations of men in our family. There's an Asante proverb that says, when you follow the path of your father, you learn to walk like him. You've groomed me to be a replica of each of the men I've saw growing up. Not only have I learned to walk like you, I've learned to be like you. I guess now that you're gone, I get to be the black sheep of the family. Thanks a lot, Dad, for your great parting gift. All joking aside, you've trained me to handle the worst, the best, and the indifference, regardless of how I might feel. You've shown me what it is to be a man of character, to have principles, to believe in self, and the most important, the importance of loyalty, and for that I am forever grateful. Throughout our lives together, we have there have been many things that we have said and didn't say. And I'm sure we are, there were moments when I would say something slick and you would wish you could slap the taste out of my mouth. But though those moments are far and few in between, well, maybe not f that few, my love and admiration for you could never be altered, broken, or lost. For all the things you have said, done, lived with me every day, all day, and twice on Sunday, it is all those moments where your words and deeds linger past the mountains, out to the sea, and up to the stars, just past the universe, that I can always gaze upon to remind me of your greatness, and under protest, I must now accept. As I stand here listening to Janaza prayer, at this place and in this where earth and sky watch meet, watching as we lay your body in the final resting place, I will slowly go on continuing down this road of life without you. I am reluctant to take the helm of this ship because the be and becoming the beacon, but I will honor your final request to finish law school. But I need you to understand that I will need some time to, to be alone, to cry, to grieve, be angry, frustrated, pissed off at you for, di at you for dying. Forever, for always, my love, M. P.S. I hope you know how much being your son has been the greatest blessing, my highest honor, grandest achievement, and the most profound unconditional love. I thank you for being my dad. I remember during one of the many times you reappeared promising to come and get my sister, brother, and myself for the weekend to spend time with us, only to experience another disappointment, another letdown, Another no call, no show. We had not seen or heard from you in months. And after that lie, years would go by without seeing or hearing from you. I couldn't understand why. I cried so much during those times. My mom was amazing, though. She never said anything bad about you to us. Instead, she always taught us to love you no matter what. She left it up to us to form our own opinions of you. Despite your absence, we still love you so much. And if it had not been for my mom, I have no doubt 
that you would have been deeply hated by my sister and I. Unfortunately for you, I mean, fortunately for you, my little brother was too young to fully understand your absence. Is it true? Were my ears deceiving me? When you told my grandmother, send for your daughter and her kids, I have plans, and a wife and kids don't fit in my plans. What the, what kind of man are you? Explain yourself, your actions. Explain why you left me for the wolves to devour. Were your plans more important than supporting your family, protecting your son who was living his very own hell on earth? I know you're probably wondering why I never told my mom or anyone else about what was going on with me. The answer, I was a child, a baby when it happened, when it began. I was also warned not to tell anyone, especially my mom. They said she would hate me and blame me, even send me away. For years, I believe it was all my fault, all my doing. I can't help but wonder that maybe, just maybe, if you had been around, I would have been brave enough to at least tell you what was going on with me. I spent so many days, nights, hours, minutes, and seconds crying, hoping that at any given moment you would walk through the door and save me. But only disappointment awaited me on the other side. I wanted to hate you. For many years I did, only to find out, only to find it was not in my heart to do so. I would end up forgiving you as quickly as I hated you. I remember answering the phone one day when you called. I asked you why you didn't love us anymore. Furious by my question, you told me to give the phone to my mother, so I did. You guys weren't aware, but I was listening on the other phone. You started yelling at her as she was begging you to come and spend time with your sons. Your sons need their father, she cried. She even promised not to put you on child support. She only wanted you to come and spend time with your kids and show us that you loved us. It was heartbreaking hearing you utter the words, I ain't got time. There were times when I thought back on those words and wonder how could someone I share the same DNA, bloodline, and name be so callous, heartless, uncaring, and selfish? It seems so easy for you to speak those words. Why did you give me your name if I didn't fit in your plans? You gentlemen are incredibly courageous uh, and fearless and brave for doing what some men would find to be an absolute horror to do. And then even more so coming here today and reading it, whether it be an excerpt or whether it being the choice to read the full entire letter. Hello, my name is Larry and I'm going to read my letter to my father. Dear Dad, it's been a, such a long time since I talked to you. I miss you so much. Things are crazy now. Laugh out loud. I wish you were here to show me how to do this daddy thing. You have three grandsons, and they're killing me, but I'm doing my best. Ro is my youngest. He's three years old now, smart, and has his grandfather's smile. It's ironic that I gave him the name Roosevelt after his grandfather. Trey's my five-year-old and a jokester, but more of a big brother to his older brother, Aiden. I named him Lawrence III, that's why his name is Trey. He has to be the leader first, the winner, as usual. Aiden is nine years old and is the animal whisperer we call him. His memory is crazy, his artwork is amazing. I'm trying, to be, I'm trying not to be hard on them, but I can't help it. 
I see so much potential in them, but I don't want to, I don't want them to squander it like I did. I got married this October, which is crazy, right? I thought my sister Lee would have done all of this before me. Married life is crazy, but I love my wife. Her name is Siobhan. We met at work. You will love her. She's very funny, loves to cook, and is a great cook. She reminds me of my grandmother that in that way. She's also like mom because she'll take your head off in a minute. She's very smart, never uses it for good though, or to make money. More to just keep me in check, I guess. But I love her though. She actually saved my life and the life of someone else. I was at a point where I let my emotions and hatred accumulate and I was going to murder a coworker that I, was, that I thought was dating mom. He tried to get me fired, he made a pass to my wife, and I just lost my mind and was ready to kill him. Luckily, Siobhan was there. She got me to call mom and ask her what was going on, if she knew the guy, which she didn't, but he just made remarks that made me think that something was going on, that they were dating. I know, I literally went crazy. But when it comes to Lee and mom, my wife and my kids, I really don't care about any consequences. Lee is great, still traveling, you know how she does. Mom's fighting cancer now. She's in her second round. She's trying to be strong, but you know how she is. But I could tell she's scared. She's fighting and winning so, so far. She's actually getting married next year also in March. I gave the guy a hard time at first, but he loves her, so he treats her good and I can't complain. I still do music, but it's one of the hardest things to get into, but I'm not a quitter. I wish you was here helping me go through this manhood thing. Without you, it's very hard, very hard. I messed up a lot along the way, but I'm trying. I got a job at a MTA. It's a dirty job, but good benefits and a pension for the fam until one of the songs pop or take off. I wish, you to hear, I wish you were here to show me and my sons how to fish and do all the things we did as a kid. Plus, I know you would have been a great grandpa, a cool grandpa. Whenever I have self-doubt, I think of how you always had my back and instill that in my sons now. Mom always tells me that I have your sense of humor, then she hits me. I love you, man. I miss you, and it's like you just passed away. Well, I gotta go, because Roro's asking for a green lollipop for the 18th time. Love you, and miss you, your son, little Larry. My name is Devon Good, and this is a letter to my dad. Where do I start? I start with, I love you. That's something that I don't tell you enough, and I'm not sure why. Maybe it's a guy thing, or maybe it's just because I assume that you knew how much I loved you. Regardless, I should tell you a lot more than I do. Your love for me was evident as early as six years old. Before I was even born, you forced my older sister to wear what was clearly a boy's baseball uniform when she was just a baby. After hearing that story several times and seeing the uniform with Scott on the back, I felt a small sense of pressure to be a great son that you desperately wanted. Another great display of your love for me was when I was about eight years old. During your 14th year active duty in the military, you decide to retire after receiving word that I was getting out of control, too much for my mom to handle, <laughs> and for the utmost, I have the utmost respect and appreciation for your decision to sacrifice your career for your family. You were, um, <clears throat> you were desperate to not let me fall victim to the streets by ending up dead or in jail. That's one of the things that I count, that's like a countless lesson for me that I always hear echoing from the back of my head. You and mom divorced when I was only 10 years old. <clears throat> right before starting middle school, emotionally, it didn't really affect me much because I didn't realize or could understand that you two were probably separated for quite some time before that due to relationship to problems or you being away with the military. I just remember being asked to choose which parent would I like to stay with. For me, 
The decision to stay with you was easy. It wasn't meant that I don't have love for my own mom or a room or cable TV or phone lines, all the things that we love. What more could a 10 year old ask for? I could always see my mom at church on Sundays. Moving in with you was one of my best decisions I've ever made in my entire life. That's when I learned the meaning of a sacrifice. I sacrificed the relaxed, hands-off parenting of my mother to live with what seemed like the angriest man in Alabama. In exchange, I got privileges that probably would never would have happened with my mom. In hindsight, they say hindsight is 2020. Thoughts about would you have done more? Would you have done less? Now that it's in print, it's sitting in front of, on people's coffee tables, in their hands, who would like, I mean, feel free to jump in and say what you. I, mean, I think that for me, there's a lot that I didn't say because there's a lot more I could have, I could have expounded on just based on the relationship um, that I didn't have with a father and then how it impacted me. And then also just um, the dynamics of really trying to make that relationship work when I met him, because it wasn't like it was smooth sailing from day one. Um, there was a lot of anger that was there and also um, a lot of, I had to learn to forgive. And it wasn't something that happened in a day or a week or a month or even a year. It was a process and it's still a process because there's still times when I think about my life and how he could have impacted it in a much more positive way. So I probably would have said a lot more, but I just, Gary asked me to, you know, if I was interested in writing a letter. So I just got off the phone and wrote something down and emailed it to him and never looked at it again. 58 just, minutes. <laughs> 58 minutes to get his letter. Just because I knew I, if, if I thought about it, I wasn't going to do it. I think for me, my issue was when my dad died, I was in law school. Um, and the day after I buried my father, my father woke me up to have this conversation because I had already decided I wasn't going to finish law school. I had made a decision that I was either going to go to law school or med school and it was a choice of whatever envelope comes first and law school came first. Um, and for me, it was how do I relive that moment when my father wakes me up and we have this conversation about why this is important, what my legacy is, why I have to have that legacy. Um, my dad names me Malik because he was a part of Malcolm's inner circle. When Malcolm died, he was El Haj Malik Shabazz, which is why my first name is Malik. My dad's a panther, which is why my last name is Shakur. So carrying that name and what it means, um, a king that is thankful to God, I have a responsibility. So when, when Gary called me, it was like, please tell me you have a great relationship with your dad. And I was like, I have an absolute amazing relationship with my dad. So for me, it was how do I tell this story or, and what do I write about? Because my dad's been dead since I was 25. But it goes back to that moment of his passing and then having to step into this responsibility to be the head of, be the, the head of my family now. So it's, it's, it, was, it was that for me, um, a reliving of that. So. Well, <laughs> for me, it was just uh, getting everything out, finally, finally, like, telling, you know, my father how I felt, you know, um, by him not being there. Like, for years, my um, half-brothers and sisters, you know, they always thought that I hated my father. Um, and at some point I did, but I forgave him a long time ago because, and I forgave him for myself, not for him, because it wasn't about him. Um, but in order for me to heal, I had to put it out there. I had to, to, to start that process, that healing process. So when, when Gary called me, I was actually in uh, Canada on sort of a self-reflection you know, um, and he called me and told me what he was doing, and I immediately told him, I, 
you know, I, I, I want to write a letter. I want to write a letter. You know, I've always wanted to tell my story um, by writing a book myself. But this is just a start to my next step, you know. And I, I, I appreciate you, Gary. My <laughs> appreciate, appreciate you. you. Thank you. All of you. Yeah, thank you. Um, for me, it was therapeutic, even though I didn't read the letter until actually yesterday after I wrote it. But it was more therapeutic, actually, to hear everybody's letters and to read it and, 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 and see what everybody else's background and what they went through also. Um, it was therapeutic for me to write the letter to my father, really, to help me be a better father myself. Because when my dad passed at 19, I was really just all over the place. So not understanding how to be a man from that point and then being that I don't understand how am I supposed to teach somebody else how to be a man when I don't know how to be. So talking, it, writing a letter really helped me get things out and just grow, you know what I mean? So I appreciate being a part of everything that's, that, that's going on right now. And thank you. Well, for me, I, I really, it was long overdue. I needed a male exhale for a long time, for real. And um, Gary has been like a counselor for me over the years as far as dealing with things, and I never was able to write about it or talk about it, ever. And um, he asked me, he told me about the book, and he said, if you want to write a letter, submit a letter. And it literally took me about, it took me about five, six months, maybe longer to write it, because I was no longer mad at my father and I wasn't mad at anyone. And I couldn't bring myself to write. I was like, well, how can I write? I'm not angry anymore. My dad and I are great friends. We have a great relationship. So I had to get down and I had to actually pray. And I said, okay, what I need to communicate to him is to let him know what I went through. Because I think he, you know, I knew he didn't know because he was in jail all my life. So he didn't know. So I was like, how can I tell him? And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just write the letter. And um, it was well received, you know, by uh, my godfather and my, my dad. Nobody actually knew except my mom, actually. And she was, you know, she's 67, so she was taught to ignore everything, you know. So that forced me to throw everything away, you know, and kind of sit on it. So this, I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful and very happy that I wrote the letter. Um, it just allowed me to breathe new life. And then even raising children now, I'm like, now I know I have to protect them and show them a different way. So it's, it's making me a better parent as well, so. My name is Tiante Kelly. I'm reading an excerpt from my letter to my father. Dear father, it took a long time to figure out how to write this letter and to which father I should write this letter to. I had to make sure my mind, body, and soul was in the appropriate and emotional state before writing this. Dear Father, in heaven, I want to thank you for providing for me, nurturing me, protecting me, and allowing me to love and appreciate this journey that this path of life has taken me on. I thank you for allowing my earthly father and myself to develop an understanding and respect for one another so that we could love each other, not just because we're related, but because we had a chance to know one another. I tried to blame my earthly father for not being there for the physical abuse, the molestation, the abandonment, and the verbal abuse. My father in heaven would not allow me to punish my earthly father for not being present and protecting me from relatives and family friends who looked me, locked me in cold basements, hung me on hooks, beat me for having sugar in my cornflakes, and the many other cases of abuse that I suffered. I could not bring myself to tell my earthly father the horrible things I endured because the man inside of me was always told not to cry about this and not to repeat it. I'm strong enough to tell you now 
and not to gain sympathy or to make you feel like you owe me anything. And the best way to say it is just to say it. Your brother had me selling drugs at each five. I was molested, thrown down the steps by an older cousin because I wouldn't stop crying. So he tried to kill me to shut me up. I then was taken to a prostitution truck stop in Monroeville, PA, and frequented many basement gambling spots on the East Liberty. My mom didn't know what was going on. She didn't know how to help me. So I was sent to live with a couple of people. I often prayed, oh God, please help me. Still, no answer. I always prayed that God would have my father come rescue me. Still, no answer. My mom thought by sending me with a married couple that it would work out, but how would she know that they would um, have me strip nude, take pictures of me naked, sitting on the toilet wearing their underwear? See, my mom thought it would be safe for a husband and wife, but it didn't work out that way. Later on in life, I thought that this was a social norm. I thought that everyone behaved like this. I thought that this was the normal thing for people to endure. Then my Heavenly Father heard my silent cry and blessed me with a bunch of village dads, like Paul Davis, Joe Davis, Harry Rose, from the all-night bowling to all of the wonderful trips that they took me on, teaching me about sports, taking me to wrestling events. These men opened up their doors as well as their hearts and taught me the correct way that a man is supposed to interact with a young man. My grandfather, who I love so much, I try to emulate him and I try to be him because he was above and beyond anyone that I could imagine. He was really sent from heaven. And that's it. I can't even go on with the letter, so that's it. In being a, a therapist, um, there's a lot of emotion going on. Did anybody, even you, Gary, you're not, don't, don't act like you can talk about your experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has anyone gone to therapy or thought about uh, any type of therapeutic experience outside of something like this, seeing a therapist, having these conversation, dialogue about law, whether it be loss, whether it be trusting the loss of trust for someone who, who violated that trust, um, the loss of your, your dad? Um, I don't think, for me, I think um, death is just a part of, of life. And for me, it was just when it happened, it happened, and it was a healing process. But it's also me moving on because now I have, a, I have a greater responsibility. As my father had the same responsibility when his dad died, and my grandfather, had, so it's, it becomes this, this firstborn thing that happened. So for me, it wasn't a need to, I need to see a therapist. I understand what it is, deal with it. I took literally, my dad died on October 4th. I think I didn't go back to school until the week before finals, which was in December. And literally, I cried every day. Um, I dealt with it. Um, my male friends couldn't understand it because they were like, why are you still upset? Because they didn't have the same or had any relationship with their dad. And even now, I visit my dad's grave and I take a bottle of blue and I sit on the grave and I <laughs> sit and I drink with him. Um, I was working at a firm and my dad, I was working at a firm and this lawyer called me a nigga during a deposition. I left my job, I went and bought a bottle of blue, walked went to the cemetery and sat on the cemetery. Came out drunk, <laughs> unbelievably drunk. <laughs> but it was this relationship that we have. And there are moments when I am in need of my dad and my, I will sit in the mosque and I will feel my dad just hug me. It's the most amazing experience to still have and still have that relationship. And actually I, um, as I've seen a therapist, you know, uh, to, all a part of the healing process and uh, um, for some time now and I actually I don't hate my father when I wrote the letter I channeled that little boy that was 
going through all of this craziness. And because I wanted it to come across to the, the reader, um, those feelings, you know, that I felt at the time. Um, my grandmother was, was um, a pivotal, uh, she was very important to me. And she taught me how to trust in God. I started um, praying the way she taught me how to say my Our, our Father prayer, um, and also doing uh, meditation. And that has helped me um, unbelievably, you know, um, for about what I started like two, three years ago, two and a half years ago. And, and just, it's just amazing of, of how when something bad happens to you, how you can see the positive. I started seeing the positive in every situation and, and just thinking positive. And um, how that, that energy came back and uh, allowed me to, to be stronger, you know. Yeah, I'll share for me that, um, you know, I have actually been through therapy. I, uh, it was something that I decided to do some time ago, just because uh, growing up, I had anger issues, and I was always angry, and it would take, it, it didn't take much to just tick me off. And even, I remember my mom always telling me, you need to learn how to control that, but I didn't know how to control that, and I didn't really even know what it was about as a kid, as a teenager growing up, and I, um, so I actually did get into therapy for a while. And interesting enough, because in our community, in the black community, and then being a male, you know, you talking to who? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? About what? <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> but, um, you know, I learned that for me, you know, it's all about uh, becoming the best person that I can be. Mm -hmm. So I really don't, I don't give a damn what people think about what I need to do to take care of myself and to make myself better and to heal whatever it is in my past that may be impacting me um, having the best life and the best future going forward. So and even now in my life, I do a lot of meditation and um, I spend a lot of quiet time just focusing and journaling and all this kind of inner work just to kind of make sure that I'm aware of what emotions are going on internally and then how I'm projecting that outward to the world and how people are seeing that because a lot of times we are carrying so much stuff with us from our past that is impacting where we are right now. And um, at this stage of the game for me, I want to let all that shit go, just let it go, <laughs> get rid of it because you can't hold on to it. Yeah. You know, it's not going to allow you to live a free life. And, and I've also learned to forgive the choices my parents made and mistakes that they made. I mean, because no one's perfect and no one's, there's no such thing as a perfect parent. And they're learning also. And for me, I just look at it like, you know, maybe he did the best he could do. Um, not that that's okay, but that was for him to deal with. Those are his issues, not mine. You know, so I'm in a different place now. I think everybody needs therapy. Especially when you in a urban environment, yeah, especially yeah. when you're in the hood and sure. you really, yeah. there is no talking to nobody about your emotions and yeah. your feelings because you, you can talk about it, you soft, so mm -hmm. <clears throat> to actually get it out is, is a very hard thing to do. Um, my mother actually passed recently, so that's what made me actually talk to my sister about therapy because it's like, you have to get it out. If you don't, it will, you will implode. You know, and a lot of urban <laughs> guys from the hub, you know, <laughs> young black men was being implode every day. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I think everybody needs some type of therapy, whether it's like I do music. So whether it's writing music, whether it's writing poetry, whether it's writing a screenplay, putting it on, on mm -hmm. the film, you know what I mean? You have to have some type of outlet to not be angry. Because yeah. a lot of us is you know, <laughs> angry and angry. don't know why. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. I think this was also, I think this is going to be therapeutic for a lot of people, reading it, and it will help them to yeah. write their own letters to whoever they need to write letters to, and, you know, just be a better person at the end of the day. I think one of the things that I, I made sure as I was going through the process is to compile a list of resources for the reader so when they finish going through the book and through the letters, there were resources in the back of the book 
So if they wanted to go to counseling or addiction or suicide prevention or their mentoring uh, organizations, I recall going to the Million Man March and it was one of the most amazing experiences for me just to see that unity. But I had this feeling, and not to slight or trivialize it, when I left, like, what's next? I said, go home and mobilize it. What if I'm not a mobilizer? What if I just need to talk and continue this energy and this spirit? My name is Gary Feimster. I'm the author, and I'm going to read a brief letter from an anonymous father. I wish I knew how to be a better man, have more time with you, and be the example that I was meant to be. If you don't forgive me for me, please forgive me for yourself so you can heal and move on from this place. I am in the shadows, in the wind, in those moments that you wonder if I ever loved you. I'm here to tell you that I loved you as much as I was capable of. The problem is I never fully learned how to love myself. No words could ever justify my actions. There aren't any words that I can say to heal your wounds. That healing must come from deep within you now. I am sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. So there's some speculation that when men don't have their fathers, they seek to emulate others, like that remind them of masculinity. Uh, and sometimes that doesn't always come from a family member. It can come from joining a gang. It can come from uh, mean, nasty boys at school. It can come from all different types of places. Can anybody think of anyone that they sought to emulate in the absence of their father, even if their father was there and it just wasn't somebody they, uh, in, the, in your mind, you thought you wanted to be when you became older? Well, my, um, for me, it was my, my, grand, my grandfather, you know, um, and also my grandmother, and my, step, my stepfather. You know, he, he's a really, really good man. Really good man, and uh, you know, that's who I saw. You know, that's why I, I followed. You know, and tried to emulate what it was to be a man. You know, mine was uh, a list of people because I I just wanted to uh, extract all the positive things from certain people, and it actually started with. Um, Michael J. Fox on Family Ties, ironically. <laughs> I wanted to be the smartest person on the planet. And I remember for Christmas, I was like, I want dictionaries and encyclopedias. I didn't want toys. Because I was like, the hell I'm going through, the way to escape it so that no one can touch me is to be as smart as anyone on the planet. And that's what I got. And I literally would cut the TV off. I'd only watch the news. and. I was that class A Urkel nerd, and I, I was happy and proud to be that dude. And then it was my grandfather, and then, like I said, a bunch of village dads who positive influence that were around me. And I just remember extracting, like, my godfather, he never missed a day at work. So you know what? Me as a grown man, I never miss a day at work, ever. No matter if I'm sick, don't matter, I'm gone. You know what I mean? Quarantine me, but I'm here. Um, my grandfather never told me no. You know, and you're not supposed to really spoil someone like that. But like my kids, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. We're going to work something out, but yes. You know, so I, I just think it's important. I, I think there's a lot of positive influence out there. Some people will gravitate towards any type of love. But um, I think fortunately for me, I, I, I knew that I wanted to be a better person. I wanted to be the best that I could be, you know. So. Um. Unfortunately, with me, it wasn't, I internalized everything when my pops passed. Like, it was more of what I saw around me, which wasn't that uplifting <laughs> and positive at the time. You know, me as, as an adult now, I'm kind of looking towards my grandfather and other people that I can, like you said, pick the positive from, from what was going on. But at the time, it was 
what is the what, what's the homies doing? And the homies didn't have mm -hmm. a father, or their mm -hmm. father passed, and they didn't know either. So you kind of raising each other in a negative mm -hmm. environment, not understanding that you actually need guidance from those who did it before you, and the ones that did it before us was not the ones we shouldn't have been listening to at the time. <laughs> but you know, it's a learning experience. So. Now with my kids, it's like I'm totally not the parent I thought I was gonna be. I thought I was gonna be the cool parent, and you know everything's cool. I'm the this and the, this. I'm the big bad daddy. <laughs> Basically, I'm the do the homework, no TV, you know. But that's because I also see with the school systems and everything else that has a big influence on why we are also the way we are in the inner city. I see their failure. So it's like, now I'm frantic, oh my God, I see what's going on <laughs> behind this, the curtain, now I gotta, you know, fix it for them, you know what I mean? So it was really like, just seeing who I was and who I didn't want my kids to be, so I gotta be better for them. Interesting, I, I, I feel um, that there were a lot of blessings in my life, even though my biological father wasn't there, because um, my stepdad really laid the foundation for me when I was young on how a man is supposed to be. And, you know, he talked about how a man is supposed to be the head of the household and how you're supposed to support your family and how you're supposed to be responsible. And he laid the foundation. This, the strange thing was um, he and my mom divorced and then he didn't take care of us or his family either. So it was kind of like a double-edged sword where he kind of laid the foundation, but then he didn't follow up on what he told me a man is supposed to be. Mm. So it kind of created a lot of confusion in my, in my mind. And that's, I think, where the anger came from. But I have to look back, and there were people in the neighborhood, like uh, Mr. Newton, who was from, I think he was from South Carolina. He was an older dude in the neighborhood, probably my grandfather's age. And he would take the young folks, all of the young fellas, he'd take us out and give us little day jobs. We'd go and we'd build like porches for people who needed a porch built or do some construction work or whatever, and he'd pay us for it but he always kind of looked out for us and taught us things. And then I think about some of my uncles or my, my mother's younger brothers who sort of would fill in when, you know, we needed somebody to do something that was male related. So there are a lot of people that, you know, I have to give homage to because they actually yeah. did jump in and sort of fill that role. But for me, when I had an image of who I wanted to be, I created my own image. I just said, how do I want to project myself to the world? What do I want people to see me like? How do I want to walk? How do I want to talk? And I literally, about 12 years old, just created this self-image of who God was going to be to the world. And then at some point, I, I had to kind of realize that it was a little boy that created that image. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> so I had to, I, and actually I had to honor that little boy and say, you know what, I thank you for that. You know, thank you for creating that. You know, I appreciate that. But there's much more to it than that even. And it's about just being, you know, true to yourself and honest and comfortable with who you are, I think, that really projects your manhood. Right. So, Gary, you didn't to talk about it. I, I mean, let me hear you say. Well, for me, uh, my father passed, as I said earlier, when I was 12, just before my 13th birthday. Um, and so for me, it was all about... Um, you know, the things he's instilled. And they continually play in my head. So, I mean, I'm the seventh son, so I had plenty of male role models in the house. And um, my father's words are very present even to this day. So even though he's in another dimension, he lives with me daily, trust me. I quote his words, I hear his voice, I talk to him before I started this. And throughout this process, I'm talking to my dad, so. Great conversation, guys. So I want to thank you all for, again, taking the time out of your lives to come and share your letters. Thank you for this project. Uh, I want to thank everyone for taking the time also to sp spend time with us today around the fire uh, as we have some really crucial conversations and real dialogue about our community. Thank you.